Hi, my name is Ken. Welcome to the SOC Stem Cell Corps. Here at the Stem Cell Corps, we focus on providing stem cells as a resource to researchers here so they can utilize them in studying human disease. Here at the Corps, we, we do this in three main areas. First, we provide the actual facility to work in. If you look around here, you can kind of see the space we're in. Here's an area we've devoted to preparing me a specialized media for working with stem cells. And this is our technician, James, and he's uh, helping us uh, make this media today. Um, another key thing we provide are reagents. Stem cells are incredibly finicky, um, so it's important to have the right materials to work with them. And so we spend a lot of our time focusing on finding the best reagents and producing those in-house to make those available to researchers here. The last major resource we provide is training. As I mentioned earlier, stem cells are difficult to work with. And so if we can train researchers on best practices on how to utilize these cells, it improves their efficiency here in the lab. Let's hop into a tissue culture bay and check out some cells. This is one of our tissue culture bays here at the SOC. Let me briefly introduce you to the space. There's kind of three key pieces of equipment we use in a tissue culture facility. Um, one of the uh, biggest uh, components are these laminar flow hoods. Um, these, these are uh, essentially sterile cabinets that we can work um, with the cells in without risk of getting those cells contaminated. Um, another key thing are uh, these CO2 incubators. These incubators are essentially a, a cell hotel. Um, the cells live in here. Um, we humidify the space, keep it at 37 degrees Celsius, which is body temperature, and also inject a small amount of carbon dioxide into, into the chamber, which helps out with gas exchange and controlling pH. Um, so the cells spend their entire day in here. The last major thing we need in a cell culture um, room is a really simple, basic microscope. Um, we have to look at these cells daily to make sure that they are not contaminated, that they're growing properly, and that they have the right visual characteristics, something we call morphology. So we do this every day, um, and we utilize these three pieces of equipment in this room to work with these cells. Let's, let's check out some cells. The first cell type we're going to look at are embryonic stem cells. Human embryonic stem cells are pluripotent, which means they can generate any of the cells in the human body. In the context of research, this is hugely valuable to us because we can take these cells and turn them into heart or skin or neurons, and we can start modeling human disease with these cells in a dish. Let's check out the cells. So what we're looking at here are embryonic stem cells. These cells grow in a structure that's called a colony. Um, and you can see the structures in the middle of the plate here, these large round structures. That's not a single cell. That's actually thousands of cells smashed together into a single unit that we call the colony. Pluripotent colonies have three distinct characteristics. First, the boundary of the colony should be extremely defined and very, very uniform compared to the background of the plate. The second major characteristic is that the cells inside the colony are extremely small. Here we're looking at 5x magnification, and at this magnification we can barely see the boundaries in between the cells. So very, very small and compacted inside that colony. The last major characteristic for pluripotent colonies are that they have a very, very large nuclei compared to the rest of the cell body. We call this a high nuclear cytoplasmic ratio. In the context of pluripotent stem cells, this has a functional purpose. Um, since these cells are primed to turn into any of the cells in our body, they have an extremely wide open genome to facilitate the machinery in the nucleus that turns on and off genes. As cells differentiate, the genome actually collapses down in a more restricted space to restrict the access and restrict the number of genes that can be turned on or off. The next cell type we're going to look at are um, some neurons. And the neurons we're going to look at actually came from embryonic stem cells. They started at, as embryonic stem cells, and we turned them into a neurons through a process called differentiation. So the cell types we're looking at now are neurons. And as I said, these were derived from embryonic stem cells through a process called differentiation, where we essentially forced the embryonic stem cells down a developmental lineage to turn into a mature neuron. Neurons look distinctly different from the embryonic stem cells we were, we were looking at before. We've completely lost that colony morphology, and now we have individual cells that are forming these networks. Neurons operate by passing around electrical impulses in the context of our central and peripheral nervous system. Here in the dish, they're actually doing this now. If we put in a special dye, we could actually visualize electricity passing between these cells in this dish. Neurons do this trick of passing around electricity by having two key parts. One part is a listening in, where an electrical impulse is received, and the other part is a speaking in, where that electrical impulse is passed on to the next cell. The last cell type I want to share with you today are cardiomyocytes. These are a really unique cell type. Again, these were differentiated from embryonic stem cells. Um, we're at this time, instead of directing these cells into neurons, we're 
treating the cells with um, a different combination of chemicals and turning them into the heart muscles of the cell. Cardio means heart, myocyte means muscle cells, so we're literally looking at heart muscle cells. These cells have a really, really unique morphology in that um, they physically pulse in the dish when they mature. And so if you look here, you'll see that there's this rhythmic beating that these cells are doing. Um, as these cells differentiate, they're actually self-organizing themselves into muscle fibers, and then they can um, uh, pass along an electrical impulse and do this contraction. And if you look here, you can see that it's somewhat organized. One area of the plate will, will beat, and then following that, other areas will beat, similar to how our, the chambers in our heart would be organized. So now that I introduced you to those cell types, the pluripotent stem cells, the neurons we differentiated from them, and also the cardiomyocytes, let me quickly show you our cryo storage system. Cryo storage allows us to physically freeze cells. Oftentimes when we generate these cell models, it's really important to be able to bank these cells down so that we can utilize them in the future. So let's check it out. So what you see here are our cryo storage tanks. These are very, very well insulated chambers that we can pump a very small amount of liquid nitrogen into the bottom of. That liquid nitrogen allows us to cool these chambers to a very low temperature, roughly negative 190 degrees Celsius. That's, that's almost 200 degrees less than the freezing point. So let me, let me pop open one of these containers and show you how this works. So in each of these containers, we have 12 racks. Each of those racks holds roughly 12 boxes of cells. Each box of cells is a nine by nine box holding roughly 89 vials. So a really large capacity for storage of material between these two freezers. Here's an example of one of those cryo storage racks. You can see all the boxes aligned in there. Each one of these boxes is specific to a project that we're working on here and has a unique cell type in it. We'll quickly open one up and show you. So you can see all the vials in this box. Each one of these vials is filled with cells in a cryogenic state. When we want to utilize these cells in the future for research purposes, we can take these vials and thaw them and put those cells back in culture, and they work similarly to the cells you saw earlier. So here at the core, one of our missions is to provide a large um, tissue culture environment for people to do research in. We currently have roughly 40 different researchers here um, from the Institute from 12 different labs. So a lot of different labs and a lot of different people utilizing that, this space. So we have to make sure we have a lot of resources for them to use. So let's quickly check out some of our other tissue culture spaces. This is a few of our researchers. This is a member of our Gage Lab, Abed, and his uh, intern, Sarah. They work on uh, neural uh, disease. So this is another one of our tissue culture space. If you take a quick look around, you can just see that we're set up the exact same way where we were in the other room. We still have the incubators, microscopes, and hoods. And you can see a few of our users working right now. This is another example of one of our tissue culture suites. Again, having a lot of different hoods and incubators for our researchers to use to do this high volume of work. Well, thanks for visiting the core. I hope you learned something about stem cells and how we can utilize them for research purposes. Have a great one.